growing in God's Word and learning what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus. This is Crosswalk with Pastor Clay Stevens from Cross Culture Church in Raleigh. Judge not, lest you be judged. Everybody loves that verse. That verse, spoken by Jesus and found in Matthew chapter 7, has been one of the most misunderstood and misused verses in all of the Bible. It seems that everyone, Christian or non-Christian, loves to quote that verse. But exactly what did Jesus mean by those words? Welcome to Crosswalk. It's a myth to say that you should never approach someone, that you should never try and get involved in someone's life, that you should never try and take them to a place where God desired, not where you desire for them to be, but where God desires. That's a myth to say that you can never say to anyone, listen, I, I love you. I know you don't agree with me about this, but I have to say to you because I care about you. Here's what God's word says. This week, as we continue our series entitled Mythbusters and our study of the Sermon on the Mount, we confront another popular myth, the belief that Christians can never confront anyone about a sinful practice. Jesus has a stern warning for those who pass judgment on others. But as we'll hear today, that may not mean what a lot of people seem to think it means. We're glad you've joined us today for this important message on judgment. Throughout this uh, teaching, Jesus has been laying out this Christian counterculture. He's been laying out this idea that followers of Jesus Christ look, act, behave differently than the culture around us. We look different not because we wear a Christian t-shirt or or put a Christian symbol on our car, but we look differently because we have decided that Jesus is who he claimed to be. We've placed our personal faith and trust in what he accomplished for us on the cross as a substitutionary payment for my sinfulness. We asked him, meaning every person that's come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, has asked him to be their Lord, to be their Savior. And because of that, suddenly our Uh, Our direction changes, or it should change. Suddenly, uh, we're interested in His will, in His priorities, in His direction for our lives. So that's what takes us in another direction. By the way, it doesn't make us any better than anybody else. It just means that we have a new direction for our lives, some new priorities for our lives. It means we're different from the culture around us, whether it's a, a a Roman or a Greek or a a Jewish culture of 2,000 years ago, or whether it's the culture of today. Followers of Jesus are called out to something different. The idea that Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at it in just a moment, this idea of judge not lest you be judged is a pretty common theme for the culture that we live in today. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say this. The golden rule, which we will look at, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, has been exchanged. It's been traded for let others do whatever they like and they'll do the same for you. Live and let live has become the mantra of the age in which we live. And if anyone should begin to uh, question a person's actions or, or what's going on in their life or discuss something with them or approach them about something that is contrary to what God's will is for their life, almost invariably everybody from the staunchest Christian to the atheist, everybody knows this verse and everybody says, uh, judge not, Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. Now, what they mean by that, the, someone who interprets that passage, what they mean by that is what someone else does with their life is absolutely none of your business whatsoever, so keep to yourself. Now, the question is this, is that really what Jesus meant in this passage of Scripture that we're about to read? In that phrase, judge not, lest you be judged, is that really what he meant? Are, are those who claim allegiance to the Lord God, does that mean that we are supposed to 
to, to go away, to, to live our life however we want to live it, but never to, to engage in someone else's life, never to uh, come into someone else's life and speak to them about something that, as, that God's word has revealed is contrary to their life. Are we never supposed to approach a brother or a sister a, a, about some issue in their life that clearly is taking them down a road that is contrary to God's will for their life? Are we just supposed to get back and get away and be quiet because judge not lest you be judged? Or is that a myth? That's what we're going to discuss for a few moments this morning. If you brought a Bible, uh, Matthew chapter 7 is where we're going to be, verses 1 through 5. And you'll find it also up on the screen this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. Worship was awesome this morning. Thank you all. I just, just, just sound it beautiful. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. That's the way the New American Standard puts it. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can we say, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, uh, today as we've gathered here for for a few moments, just for a little while, a little section of our lives to come apart corporately and worship you. The past week and probably the week ahead of us is going to be crazy. It's going to be hectic. It's been difficult for some. It's perhaps been good for others. What lies ahead of us in, in the next week, we don't know. But we have right now, we're gathered in this place. The songs that we've sung were written and were played and were sung by, by people gathered here, Lord God, who just, we just want to acknowledge you as sovereign Lord God. And people may be in different place in that journey, Lord God. Some here have followed you for many, many years. Others are just now exploring what there is to this whole Christianity thing, this, this idea of being a follower of Jesus and who he was. Some people are just in process of that. Lord, thanks. Thanks for everybody that's here. Some who've come through the doors for the very first time and others who have been part of cross-culture since the beginning. Thank you that, uh, that you're working on us. You never give up on us and you're, oh, I'm so grateful you don't give up on me. And we've gathered here today to look at your word for a little while and, and discuss something really that, uh, that's very important. For our lives, because I certainly know, Lord God, I, I've heard that many times in my life. You can't judge. You can't judge someone. What did you mean by that, Lord Jesus? That's what you said. That's what your words say. So we just want to be accurate. We want to be right. And so I, I ask that you would, you would take me, your messenger boy today, and just use me to break your, your word to these people. They're hungry, Lord God. They're hungry for your word. They didn't come here just to hang out for a while, although it's great to, to see people and fellowship and say hi and hug and speak and all that, but they came for something more, I believe, Father God. Uh, so may you guide and direct us. May you teach us. May you be pleased with what goes on in here today. Father, I also just want to take just a moment to just pray. It's just amazing how it seems things, things happen suddenly in our lives. And uh, this week... Uh, Greg Bass and his family lost, uh, lost his mom, grandmother. And then yesterday afternoon, Lord God, Nate Jones suddenly loses his father. And then this morning I get here and I find out that David McDonald's suddenly lost his grandmother last night. All of them were a powerful impact on each of those families and others. All three of them were strong believers and we rejoice with where they are. Because the, your word says truly to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And by faith, we believe that there's something beyond this life. So we rejoice for them and where they are. But we pray, continue to pray for your comfort, for your hand upon families uh, grieving the loss. As they're left here, Lord God, to tend on this earth and to struggle through like the rest of us until that time when you call us home. So, uh, Lord, make this time really, really profitable for everybody. And uh, we just, we're just grateful. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Okay, so exactly what are we talking about here? I want to share with you some, some ideas that I have from Matthew chapter 7 about this idea of judging. And what does Jesus really mean when he says, do not judge lest you be judged in the same manner? Let me share some ideas. Let's start, start with this one this morning. When it comes to judging, you need to, uh, first off, you need to understand your role. What is your role in this thing? As Jesus speaks these words and as he's teaching, exactly what is your role? Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. The famous Russian author Leo Tolstoy believed that with these words, Christ was, was totally forbidding uh, the entire judicial system as the world knows, knows it. Tolstoy believed that what Christ was saying was that there should be no legal system, no judicial system whatsoever, no court, no judges, no law, anything like that. that that's what Jesus was saying. Well, let me just say, first off, that interpretation is impossible. Uh, for one thing, the context of the passage of Scripture is not dealing with judges and, and courts of law. It's dealing with individuals and the responsibilities that we have toward each other. Second, if we took Tolstoy's uh, interpretation of the text, it would mean no, no legal system, no penalties, no anything. What would result would be total anarchy and chaos. And... Since we know that our God is a God of order and not a God of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, then we know that cannot be what it would be because Jesus would never command us to do something that violates the very nature of God himself. So whatever Jesus means, and we'll get to it in a minute, it can't mean no, no judges at all. Nor can it mean, and this is, this is the biggie, nor can it mean that you and I are supposed to totally suspend all of our critical factors, all of our critical uh, judgmental abilities when it comes to discerning uh, where other people are in their lives. It can't mean that. Although that's how people like to interpret a lot of times, right? 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 It can't mean that you and I are just supposed to suspend our our. our critical faculties and say, well, no, and I can't make any judgment. It can't mean that. Here's why. This entire, in this entire teaching that, that we've been going through, this Sermon on the Mount, throughout this teaching, Jesus has been calling us to a different standard, a different standard in, in our actions, a different standard in our, in our righteousness, a different standard in our priorities. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is constantly about, is this, is this calling us to something different, this, this different walk in life. The very fact that Jesus would call us to, to live a different standard of righteousness than those of the culture around us, a different life, uh, life uh, uh, choosing, a different uh, uh, priorities of life, the very idea that he would call us to do this, would require that we make some type of discerning uh, observations about the, the lifestyles and, the, and the, 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 the culture around us in order to live by a righteousness, live by a standard, live by priority, live with priorities that are different than those of the culture. So, so it can't mean that. Listen, we, we'll cover ne- uh, verse 6 next week, but isn't it interesting that right on the heels of giving this commandment, do not judge, that right on the heels of this, in verse 6, he says, do not cast your pearls before swine, before he talks about dogs and pigs, and in verse 15, he says, beware of false prophets. It's impossible to obey either one of those commands unless you make some type of uh, critical discernment as to who are, the, who are the dogs and pigs and the false prophets. So, what does Jesus mean? When he says, judge not, lest you be judged. Well, let's look at it. Uh, the word uh, judged in the Greek that the New Testament was originally written in is krino. Now, it, it means to judge. It means judgment. But it also carries this connotation. It often carries the connotation of condemn or to condemn or condemnation. And it is 
in this sense, I believe the context bears out, it is in this sense that Jesus is making this statement, do not judge lest you be judged. He's not saying that you can't, that you have, can't make observations about where a brother or sister is in their walk and where they've strayed and what may be headed into their life that's contrary to God's will. He's not, he's not saying that. What he's talking about is the person with a, with a condemnatory, critical uh, holier than thou attitude. That's who he's talking about. That's who Jesus is concerned about here. And can I tell you this? That kind of attitude shows up way too often in our lives. And by our, I'm referring to the church, believers. Some of you heard me re- mention before, I, I recently finished a, a book entitled Unchristian. And it's, a, it's, how, it's how those outside the church walls view those inside the church walls. Very, very interesting book to read. But but I'm going to tell you something. The church is not looked real highly on by those outside the church. Do you know that? And, and I'll confess this. Much of it is probably deserved. Their, their attitude or their approach toward it. Much of it is probably deserved. Because of how the church, how supposedly Christians have reacted to someone uh, in, in whatever sense, whatever lifestyle they're in, whatever place they are in their life because of the way they have been approached by Christians or by the church in a very judgmental, condemnatory, uh, accusatory manner, we've probably earned a good bit of that. And Jesus says there's no place for that type of attitude in the church. This was a lot of years ago, I was um, uh, visiting a lady uh, that I was trying to share the good news about Jesus with. And she told me that uh, she had visited a church one time many, many years ago as a, as a young woman. She was an elderly lady that I was visiting with. Many, many years ago as a young woman, she had visited a church. And she said she hadn't grown up in church, didn't know about church, but she, she wanted to go to church. She was all about. She went into church. She sat down behind two ladies who were already seated in the, in the church when she got in there. And these two ladies were carrying on a conversation between each other, as, as all of us are prone to do at times, talking and just carrying on. And as they're talking, this is before the service began, as they're, as they're talking, um, she says another lady enters, because uh, people are coming in, getting ready for church, another lady enters from a side door, off to the kind of the side of where these two ladies are, they're having this conversation. And the woman who I was t- speaking with, who was in church for the first time, said that one of the ladies in the conversation said to the other lady in the conversation, I want you to look at Mary Smith over there. That wasn't her name, but I want you to look at Mary Smith over there. If I didn't have anything better to wear to church than that, I just wouldn't come. It's that critical condemnatory, judgmental attitude. That's what Jesus is talking about. By the way, the lady that I was speaking with said that she got up, walked out of church, and never entered the doors of a church again. It's I, this idea that, that somehow I'm, I'm better than you or I'm superior to you or I have the right to judge you. You need to understand your role. I need to understand my role. I've been studying John Stott a lot during the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, Stott said this. I wanted to read this a little lengthy, but I want you to hear this. Stott says, it does not mean, now listen, it does not mean to assess people critically. He, He says, that's not what Jesus is talking about. It does not mean to assess people critically, but to judge them harshly. The censorious critic is a fault finder. You know anybody like that? Someone who is negative and destructive toward other people. The person who enjoys actively seeking out people's failings. He or she always thinks the worst about a person. Always doubts a person's motives. Always ungenerous toward other people's mistakes. It is the person who has taken it upon his or herself to sit in judgment of others. Do not judge. That's what Jesus is saying. That's who he's talking about. Warren Wiersbe says this, um, which kind of points out verse 2, where uh, he's referring to the idea that um, uh, from the way you judge, you will be judged. Wiersbe says that the parallel passage to this, Luke chapter uh, 6, verse 37 and 38, I think it is, he says, kind of clarifies. Here's what Wiersbe says. Not only will God judge you at the end, but people are judging you right now, and we receive from people exactly what we give. Do, Do you know that that's true? Don't you know that's true? If, if, if you think that's not true, um, if you're married, 
When, when you go home today, just, just give your spouse a hard time. Just, just tell them, you know, oh, you. I don't know, something. <laughs> Come up with something. See how they react to it. Very good possibility, unless they're really walking in the Spirit. There's a pretty good possibility that they're going to react to you that way. And, and the same thing is true of, of this ju- judgmentalism. To judge somebody, it's what we, what we give, is what we get back. The kind of judgment and the measure of judgment comes right back to us. We reap what we have sown. This is a biblical concept. You find it throughout Scripture. Job chapter 3, 3 or 4, verse 8. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. All speak of the fact that what you sow in life is what you reap. It comes back to you. No business. Got no business doing it. Understand your role. You are not God. And the judgment seat is already taken. Now, as we're going to see in just a moment, that doesn't necessarily mean that you suspend your faculties towards other people and where they are in their life. We're going to see that Jesus not only tells you to, but that you have an obligation to respond to it. Can we just kill these lights totally? Is there a way? No, they're just, they're on. Okay, good. Um, Jesus says that, you have a, that he has an expectation on our life. And we're going to see that. That something we will in some way react and do something about it. It's not your role to play judge. All right. Here's a second idea. When it comes to judging, you need to examine your condition. Why don't we all just say that out loud? Examine your condition. Oh, let's change it. Let's say examine my condition. Okay? Everybody say it out loud one time. Examine my condition. Examine my condition. Let me read verse 3 through the first part of verse A, 8, 5, something. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? Do you not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, watch this, first take the log out of your own eye. First take the log out of your own eye. Now, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't say that there's not a problem, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute. He doesn't say that there's not a problem with someone else. He says there's a problem with, with you and where you are in your life. He says uh, someone has a splinter, karphos, I believe is the word in the Greek, Carfos. It's a speck. It's a, it's a tiny speck. It's a tiny little splinter. Jesus gives this, this kind of what I would call a super exaggerated example. And by the way, it's the kind of example you would expect from a carpenter. He says, somebody's got a little splinter in there. I got a splinter last week putting the, the Mythbusters sign up. I got a splinter. Hurt so bad. It was terrible. Thought I'd have to go to the ER about it. He, somebody's got a little splinter in their eye. He says, but you, he said, you've got a log, quite literally, uh, a beam. You, you've, got a, you've got a floor joist in your eye. You've got a floor joist in your eye. This guy's got a splinter. You've got a floor joist, and you're trying to help this guy? And, you know, and essentially, Jesus is saying, what's wrong with this picture? And it's, it would be hilarious. It would be comical if it wasn't so sad. You, you, he's... Jesus, he's a master teacher. He's drawing this visual image for us. You can just see this guy with this beam sticking out of his eye, and he's trying to help this other guy get this little splinter out of his eye. Jesus says, you hypocrite. Man, examine your own condition. Look at yourself before you even begin to start thinking about looking at somebody else. How can you even think about straightening somebody else out when you're dealing with an issue like this? Examine your own condition. Where are you? When's the last, can I ask you this? When's the last time you personally did a self-examination of your life? I mean, you just, I mean, you sat down, you took some time, and, you, and you, you critiqued yourself. Where am I? How do I do this thing? How do I act towards other people? What kind of words do I use? What, what's, where's my mind going? And what are the thoughts that I have? What am I watching on the TV or Internet? Where, all this kind of stuff. When's the last time you sat down and did some self-examination of your own life? Because I'll tell you this, we tend to magnify other people's sins and minimize our sins, don't we? You've you got to examine your own condition. This is a number of years ago. I won't name the, the church, uh, but there was a very, very prominent church in America that had a very, very prominent pastor. He was considered one of the greatest preachers in America. 
And every week he stood in the, uh, on, the, on the stage, every day he, on the platform, behind the pulpit. Every week he, he beautifully expounded God's word and he taught the people what they should do and what they shouldn't do and what God's expectation was for their life. And at the same time, simultaneously, he was running around on his wife sleeping with his church secretary. I sleep with my church secretary, but I'm, I'm married to her, so it's all right. Right. <laughs> You hypocrite. How can you do this? How can you be, be looking at this other person and saying, oh, look what's going on in their life. Look what they're doing. And you don't even see what's going on in your own life. I read a story a number of years ago about a, uh, a woman who pled guilty to stalking a man in New York. This is, this is in, in uh, New York State somewhere. Um, she, a buddy, I mean, it was like, you know, it was like, hoot, 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 kind of stuff. It was... Uh, she, she chased him down with a car. She uh, harassed, you know, like hundreds of phone calls, hang-up phone calls. She even impersonated uh, a cosmetic person at a, at a mall counter place uh, so that she could get the name, uh, the phone number of the ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. She was arrested. She was accused of stalking. And she was, was convicted. Now, what made the story interesting, what makes the story interesting is that the woman uh, by the name of Nancy Calhoun was uh, in the New York State Legislature, and she had been co-sponsor of an anti-stalking legislation bill. She says, you hypocrite. Get your act together. Can I tell you this? Listen, Jesus doesn't, I don't believe that Jesus, you know, says your sin is a beam and this guy's sin is a tiny little splinter. I don't think he says that because maybe what you're doing is, is more grievous, you know, that you're into deeper sin. That's not the point. You're, listen, listen, my sin is bigger because it's my sin. That's why it's a beam. And it, it, it ought to be as obvious as a beam in my eye, not just a tiny little splinter. I think something's kind of aggravating my eye. I'm not sure. No, if there's a beam sticking in your eye, you're probably going to know it. And Jesus, that's the now. That's what it ought to be in your life. Um, This is important. uh, This quote from R.T. France. The hypocrite's error, watch this, and we're going to get to it in just a minute. The hypocrite's error is not in the diagnosis of his brother. That's not where he messes up or sister. But in his failure to apply to himself the criticism that he meticulously applies to. To his brother or sister. That's the danger. You need to examine your own life, your own condition. Where am I in this? Now, uh, Warren Wiersbe brings out two extremes in this that I think are worth mentioning. I want to give those to you before we move on to the, to the third idea this morning. Uh, first, it's what, he, what Wiersbe calls the deception of shallow examination. You know, it's the idea that. Here it is. It's like, well, I know I'm not perfect, but ba 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 yada yada yada. It's that kind of attitude. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I know I'm not perfect, but did you hear about blah 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 blah? It's it's just a. Can I tell you this? It, it, when I tell you, when's the last time you did a self examination? It's like this. It's like a glance. When what you and I need in our life is an intense study of our lives to see where I really am in this thing, to see what what areas I've let come into my life, what. Where, where places I've let my guard down and where maybe there's some sinful practice going on in my life that needs to be dealt with. Wiersbe says, watch out for the extreme, the deception of a shallow examination. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm checking my motives. Well, don't just say it so quickly. The other extreme is this. It's what Wiersbe calls the perpetual autopsy. It's the, it's the person that looks so deeply into their own life, so deeply at self-examination, that all they see is brokenness and sinfulness and, and mistakes that they've made, and that's all they see, and they live, they live discouraged, and they live defeated, and they live depressed, and they're no good for themselves or for anybody else. They can't even think about helping anybody else because they're so, oh, I'm such a sinner. Uh, I, I, I forgot to... Uh, take out the trash. Oh, I'm so... And I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not trying to make light of sin. I'm just saying it's this constantly evaluating myself to the extent that it makes me no good for anybody at all. No. Jesus says, look at your own life. Examine your life first. And then now, third, the final idea is this. Offer your assistance. Offer your assistance. Last part of verse 5. I'll just read all of verse 5. Again, you hypocrite, you hypocrite, you two-faced, you person that wears a mask. First, take the log out of your own eye. 
Watch this. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, Jesus doesn't say there's not a problem with your brother or sister. He doesn't say that there's not something that needs correction. Which, by the way, that in itself negates this interpretation of judge not lest ye be judged. To, it, it, again, it shows that it can't mean that I, can ne- that I should never look or evaluate a person's life and where they are. Jesus says there's a problem. They've got a, they've got a, they've got a speck in their eye. They've got a splinter. They've got a problem in their life. But you've got to clean up your act. But when you do, you need to do something. Hey, can I tell you this? Hey, hey listen. Somebody, I've said this before, somebody ought to give a rip about the rest of the people in the world. Some, somebody ought to say that, that it matters. I, if I had a dime for every time I've heard, well, you know, I can't judge them. I've never been in their shoes. Listen, I've never been in the shoes of a murderer, but I'm pretty sure it's wrong. I've never been in the shoes of a child molester, but I know that it's a distic- despicably horrible act. Somebody's got to give a rip. Somebody's got to care. As uh, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge's partner, Jacob Marley, said, mankind is my business. Or should have been my business. It's to offer your assistance to someone that you see is headed down a a road, a direction that clearly is in contrast to what God's direction or will is for their life. And being able to care enough about them to approach them, and if I can use this term, confront them about the issue in their life that God says, this is not what I created you for. This is not what my will is for your life. I need you to come out. I need you to live life the way I expect and and." Created you to live your life. Now, I know that's not always easy, and I, I know that there, you've got to be careful in how you do that, and, and I know all that, that kind of stuff, but, but man, somebody's got to care. Somebody's got to care enough to risk, to at least offer our assistance. I, I read about a group of people that went uh, deer hunting, and uh, they split up in, in pairs of, of two. And in the evening time, uh, here came uh, uh, Ralph, a tote just kind of struggling under the weight. Not our Ralph, but, I mean, he's probably a deer hunter, but you know, it's struggling under the weight of this 12, huge 12-point 12 buck that he's, that he's carrying back to, to camp. And he gets back to camp, and, uh, and somebody says, where's Harry? And he's like, oh, oh my God. <sighs> Harry, uh, Harry broke his leg back there about a mile and a half uh, down the trail. He's back down there. And, and, and uh, somebody says, you left Harry on the trail and brought the deer? And the guy says, well, I, I figured nobody's going to steal Harry. <laughs> hey, 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 somebody's got to care. I mean, if there's some sort of compassion in you, if there's some sort of idea that, that God loves people and he wants to love people through you, uh, somebody's got to be able to, to offer their assistance to them and say, man, I, I, I'm, I'm no better than you. Don't claim to be better than you. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God, and, 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 and I mess up all the time. But let me tell you, I, I see you heading down this road. You're, you're, you're thinking about uh, cheating on your spouse. You're, uh, you're, you're doing something, whatever. Whatever it takes you, if it's contrary to God's will, you ought to offer your assistance. By the way, um, you got to offer your assistance. You, you can't demand your assistance. Sometimes people just won't receive what you have to say. Did you ever, did this ever happen to y'all when, when y'all were kids? Uh, did you ever, did, did you ever be off somewhere like with your mom? And um, maybe you got a, like some dirt on your face or chocolate or something. Are you ever off with your mom somewhere and all of a sudden she grabs hold of you and she licks her fingers and she starts rubbing your face like that? Did that ever happen to y'all? Y'all, y'all ever, did, ever happen to y'all? I hate it that. I hate it that. <laughs> rubbing, you know. And it's like, I know, you're like squirming and you're trying to turn my head, trying to get away. And she's got this death grip around your neck, you know. You can't go anywhere and you're trying. Because it was like embarrassing and it was sometimes. If you try and if you try to, and lo- even if you've examined your own life and you've tried to make right the things that might be wrong in your life and, and as best you know how, you're living to try and honor the Lord and, and your motives are generous. Sometimes even then when you go to someone and you try and approach them about a, 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 something in their life, that is harmful based on what God's word says, sometimes they're they're going to be kind of like that. They're going to squirm and they're going to try and get away. They're probably going to become angry with you. They may not want to have anything to do with you or or write you off or or whatever. I I, I don't know. But I know this. Jesus says there is a speck in somebody's eye. It it does need to be taken care of. And and if I understand my role that, that, that I'm not their judge, but you know what? 
as a follower of Jesus Christ, I ought to care about them enough. Uh, no, my role is not to judge them. My role ought to be to care about them. And I better examine my own life, and I, and I better make sure all those beams are pulled out of my eye. And I, I know none of us are ever perfect, and, and that's part of the problem. We keep thinking, well, I'm not perfect. I can't say anything. You're never going to be perfect this side of heaven. But, it, but if I'm dealing with the issues in my life, if, if, it's, if it's greed or lust or whatever it is, pride, ego, arrogance, anger, whatever it is, if I'm dealing with those things, then Jesus says, then. Go and try and help your brother or your sister. It's a myth. It's a myth to say that you should never approach someone, that you should never try and get involved in someone's life, that you should never try and take them to a place where God desires. Not where you desire for them to be, but where God desires. That's a myth to say that you can never say to anyone, listen, I, I love you. I know you don't agree with me about this, but I have to say to you because I, because I, I care about you. Here's what God's word says. Let's turn. Let's look at God's pages. I'm not your judge, but I'm telling you this. God is, and God doesn't grade on a curve. And because I give a rip about your life, I'm I'm telling you, I'm here to help you. I'll do whatever whatever I can to help you come out of where you are. Not because I'm judging you or think that you're wrong, but because here's what God's Word says. And offer your assistance. As we've learned today, when it comes to other people's lives, Christians can't take up the judge's seat. That's reserved for God alone. But that doesn't mean we turn a blind eye. Followers of Jesus have an obligation to try to help others experience God's liberating truth about sin. But in order to do so, we have to make sure that we've examined our own lives and dealt with our own sin. We're glad that you could join us for this week's lesson on Crosswalk. Crosswalk is updated weekly at crosswalkonline.org. From Cross Culture Church, we extend the invitation for you to join us live and be a part of the congregation. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 at the Leesville Road Middle School in Raleigh. It's a mile and a half south of I-540. We welcome anyone looking for a place to learn about God's plan for their life. At Cross Culture, you'll find a community of believers with the desire to be used by God to show that a life built on the finished work of Christ on the cross is where you'll find what you're looking for. Culture Church, a new church for people like you. Learn more about us, who we are, what we're about, what we do, and what we believe. Visit us online at crossculturelife.org. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.